major Imran, son of Ahmed, son, a grandson of Warsami, is uh, in the Somali military. He joined the military, uh, Somali's military, in 2013, and recognizing his tremendous potential, his country sent him to attend Turkey's Air Force Academy, located in Istanbul. Imran graduated and returned to Somalia in 2018. He's a registered professional engineer and speaks several languages, including Turkish, Arabic, and English, and of course, Somali. At the Turksum Military Academy, he was a company commander, and he worked closely with multinational partners stationed in Somalia, which included the United States military forces. His exceptional talent and ability were noticed. He was called to the Prime Minister's office in Mogadishu and appointed as the, Soma as Somali, as the Somali military's new chief of personnel. In this position, Major Imran reformed the personnel system and modernized human resources management policy for the Somali military. Before coming to the United States, Imran was serving as security advisor to the elections implementation team. Now, two insights about uh, Imran he thought that we can share. First, we discovered together professional team bull riding. <laughs> <laughs> but, just like electric scooters, INSD won't let him ride. <laughs> Second, the average temperature uh, in Imran's hometown, Galkeo, is 82 degrees Fahrenheit year round. Now, over the winter break, Imran uh, made a trip to Minneapolis <laughs> to visit his cousins. And he had his first encounter with minus 11 degree Fahrenheit weather. <laughs> Fortunately, he survived, <laughs> and now he's finding our northeast Kansas weather an endless summer. <laughs> and it sure seems like it today. It's my honor to present our friend, Major Imran. Thank you very much. I'm very honored today to be here to present you a country briefing about Somalia. So, uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, what do you know about Somalia? Any idea, any biases, anything bad or good? It's not important. Just anything. Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down. Yeah, I'd say that's what you have. Pirates. Pirates, yes. <laughs> One of the most beautiful countries in East Africa. Nice, yes, oh. the country is beautiful, yes. yes. What, so anything else? Minneapolis. Minneapolis, a lot of Somalis, yes. They live there? Yeah. Okay. That's very good things um, to share. So, the pirates, you know them. And also, there's these guys called Al Shabaab. They are like a terrorist group in Somalia, ISIS. So, maybe you knew about them. And you said Minneapolis, there's uh, this. Who comes from? Uh, she's in the representative's office, so maybe some of you may know her. Uh, this is a judge in uh, international criminal criminal court. He was the head of the, the court. Now he's a normal member of it. We have uh, an athlete in United Kingdom. He's normal from Somalia. He's a multiple uh, gold champion in world athletes, like 10,000, 5,000. Some of you, if you are interested in sports, you may know him. This lady is also um, like fashion people in, uh, in the Western countries. You also have a, a singer who says who, his song was chosen for 2010 World Cup. If you don't know all of this, you have no idea, don't worry, there is a, another picture that we have for you that I 
I'm sure you know. <laughs> yeah. This is our game that we had uh, in, in Kansas. It was so beautiful. So, um, I prefer was Somalia. I will start with the, the flag and the name where it came from. So, if you look the name, there's a lot of uh, opinions about it. Some say Somali means Somal, which means go get milk from the goat or the cow or the camel. It's like a fur, right? Go get milk. So if you are a, in Somalia, if you are a guest and you go to a nomadic people, normally we are in the, we live in nomadic areas. We have like a lot of camels, a lot of livestock. So if you come as a guest, people will give you milk because they have a lot of animals. So you would hear a lot of Somal, Somal fair, like, hey, get him, there's a guest here. So one opinion says a lot of people who are not from Somalia, they heard this verb and they said, hey, there is a people called Somal in that area. That's the one opinion. The other opinion is it is the father of Somalis, his name was Samale. Because my name is Imran, Ahmed is my father, or some is my uh, grandfather. It's, I can go like 12 names. So people go that far, and they ended up in a person who's called Somali, and they said, we are Somalis. So that's the two major opinions that people may have in the name. The flag took 1960s, one of the Somali thinkers thought about a flag, and he came up with the blue color and a star in the middle of it. The star represents five parts of Somalia, and you will see about it. The color, the blue color, comes from the sky. So it's very uh, easy, but also good. So the outline would be today, uh, I will give you an introduction, history, government, military, culture and environment, religion and language, and also the population and the economies of Somalia. And we will have conclusion of uh, something that I learned in uh, Command General Staff College is every time you present something, so what? <laughs> this is the so what slide that you will have from my perspective. <laughs> and we will have some questions. So in Somalia, where is Somalia? Anybody knows where Somalia is? It's <laughs> from Kenya, so yes. Anybody? Where is it? It's in the Horn. Horn of Africa? Yep. Yes. So Somalia, um, country in North Africa, longest coastline on Africa mainland. We have, we have a, a guest here who is from Kenya. So you can see in here, we have <coughs> Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, they share borders with us. There is Somalis who live in that areas. And you, if, add, if you add up Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Kenya, three parts, there is also two other parts in Somalia that comes to five parts, which is the flex star. So we have a video here that would give you a brief about Somalis, the people, how they live, sports, culture, music, military, anything. <laughs> هاي <تصفيق> Thank you.
هوي لقى ورني هلي هوي حنتي أي مع وامدا هوي لقى ورني هلي هوي حنتي أي مع وامدا. Okay, and the video showed you a lot of culture, music, military, a lot of stuff. Any questions? Any comments? We will have that. Do you have one? Just a question on the one where um, there were a lot of people going down the street with flags. Yes. Was that a celebration or a protest? Or? That was uh, actually in not in Somalia. I think it's in Minnesota. There was a Somali politician who visited that area, and they were. Like well, yeah, we, we, we don't have a lot of protests with good flags. <laughs> yeah. We may have protests, but there, there's no flags. A lot of tires burning tires. <coughs> so the history, if you go to Somalia and if you try to find out the history, you will find some places that have pictures like this, which is an old picture, and they say it's around 2,500 years ago. So the land Somalia located is a lot of history and people used to live there long, long ago. So maybe there were Somalis or other people, but there, are, there was people's um, architects, something that you can find there. And later on, Somalia became a hub of the silk and drug initiatives that China had, and also there was a lot of economic and uh, drugs that go through Somalia, Mogadishu, which is the capital city of Somalia, was a good place for the a lot of empires to come and sell their goods. So Somalis, no, they were nomadic people, but there were also some people in Somalia that had connections with the outside world at that time. And <clears throat> This is also the same thing. There's a picture there that shows um, some humans and trying to get some silk and spice things to Egypt. That's what they say. So in 1830s, Gasu came to Somalia with a lot of ships, the British. And they, <laughs> they came for normally for uh, economic, you know, uh, relations. But later on, one of the Somalis who came from Saudi Arabia, who was a religious leader, he thought that this is a colonial, colonial mindset, and he tried to fight against them. 19, 1830s to 1920s, he was fighting. There's a lot of books written about him. In Western world, they call him Mad Mullah because he was first in fighting. But then um, he lost the war because of uh, air, for, air Force. The Italians uh, used airplanes. And some opinions say it's the first time an airplane uh, bombs one in Africa, somewhere in Africa. That's what they say. In the 1920s, they lost and uh, Mohammed. Abdullah Hassan is a figure in Somalia that people respect and they love him and he has a lot of uh, and status in some places because he was fighting for the independence at that time. 1960 and after the World War II there was a lot of changes happening in the world. Somalia was part of that without any fight and Italy and British which was the colonial powers in Somalia, they gave the independence to Somalia, and we had, 1960, the first government in Somalia. So, <clears throat> 1960 to 1969, we had a government which was kind of democratic. In 1969, up to 2000, up to 1991, we had a government which was military government. So, 1991, we had a civil war because the government, some measures that people say it's suppressive, and 
clans fought against it, a lot of militias fought against it, and he lost the war. 1991 to 2000, there was a stateless time in Somalia. There was no government, no rules, no traffic lights, nothing, zero. In 2000, some Somali political elites came in outside of Somalia to form a government. To 2004, they had a government outside of Somalia. In 2004, Mogadishu was controlled by warlords. If you watch the Black Hawk Down, there was a guy called Farah Hadid, who is the, the main actor that the United States tries to catch. There was a lot of guys like him. So in 2004, he like people like him, warlords, and there was leaders, religious leaders, they fought against the warlords. And in 2006, Mogadishu was controlled by religious leaders. So the government outside of Somalia, they had a backing from Ethiopia and also the United States because the Islamic kind of uh, leaders said we're going to invade Ethiopia. So Ethiopia, with the help of the United States, with other Western countries, with the government that was outside of Somalia, they came to Somalia, and a fight, a big war, like kind of a civil war, broke um, between Somalis and also there was Ethiopian forces in Mogadishu. So there's, after that war, in 2009, a Shabab group came up, came up because they said there is uh, Ethiopians, Ethiopians are not Muslims, they invaded our country, they killed Muslim people, we have to fight against them. From 2009 and until now, we have Al Shabab group. That's where they came from. 2012, we had an election in Somalia. That was the first time that we had a democratic election after the civil war. We had a government that tried to fight, continue the fight against Al-Shabaab until 2007. Then we had another election that tried to reform the military, kind of what my sponsor told you about reforming the military and personnel management, finance, a lot of logistics, a lot of things of reforming. 2022, we had another election. The president who was in 2012's president came back again, and now there was a fight against Al-Shabaab going on. So what I want you to understand now is how Somalia forms a government. That's what I want to tell you now. So in the United States, you have representative senators, people vote, and you have mainly two main political leaders that come and people vote for them. In Somalia, you have people called the elders. If you are above 55 until you die, you are an elder and people respect you in Somalia. So if you understand the role of the elders of Somalia, you understand the government. So let's say I'm like 60 year old guy. And in my uh, 11th area, I am the, the respected leader. So let's say one from Leavenworth wants to be a senator or a representative. He has to come to me talk to me and I will endorse him and then people will vote for that person. So the elder is kind of to go person. You ask him and not every elder, you have to gain the respect along the years. You have to be a good person. People will say, hey, that person is an elderly and we respect him or her. Go to them and listen to them. Then come to us. So an elder is the first place that you start if you want to be a president. And then there's the member states like Kansas, Missouri, you know, Florida, you know, states that you have. Florida is a state. Yeah. <laughs> you know what to make us. So, and the member states, they have presidents, like you have governors now. We call them president because they like the name. <laughs> so the president's also chosen by the elders representatives. Elders represent local representatives and that local representatives elect the governor. So you have the governor who is elected by the representatives 
chosen by the elders. So the power goes back to the elders. Then you have the federal parliament, like in your, you have in your country. That federal one is also chosen by representatives, chosen by the elders, again. So again, there's the elders. Then you have the senators. Senator is like two, three, five. Every state has a number of set of numbers. Let's say I'm the governor, and in Somalia you will be the president of uh, Kansas state. You choose 12 senators, for example, from your own state. So the elders, they don't have a direct impact in the, on the senators, but they have an impact on the governor. So you have senators, federal parliament, elders, member states. When it comes to the president, the president is chosen by federal parliament and senators, like 327 kind of people. Then you have the president. President chooses a prime minister himself, and then the parliament approves that person. The prime minister comes up with a cabinet of ministers. So the Somali government it comes from the elders all the way up to the president, to the prime minister, and to the ministers. That's how it is. Now when it comes to military, um, we were one of the strongest in Africa. After the Civil War, everybody in the military, like imagine like a country which has a military. After the Civil War, everybody in the military went back to their clans because there were some clans who were fighting another clans and nobody wants their clan to die. So they get their, you know, everything back to their clan. And you have military fighting under the names of clans. Because the elders, as I told you, are important. If a president does not give the importance given to an elder from a, like Kansas City, Kansas State, that elders, they will have problems with the president, and the president will have problems with the ministers from that state so in 1991, there was big clans against the president. So that's, that's why we had a fight. After 2012, the government tried to come up with a plan to, to invent, like to regenerate some forces. We have like 30,000 army, which mostly are comprised of militias who were fighting Al-Shabaab in their own way of fighting. But now we have a lot of uh, also professionally trained soldiers and officers by mostly Turkey, Italy, Egypt. You have a lot of countries, Sudan. Now you have a lot of, uh, a lot of soldiers trained by United States. There's special forces and the officers um, like me, there's a lot of officers that go to Fort Penning for trainings. So now we are trying to rebuild a military, but we don't have an Air Force or Navy that are functional now. We only have an army, and we have an army embargo on Somalia. We cannot get a lot of big weapons because the United Nations Security Council does not think and sometimes I personally think they are right that if you give Somalis big weapons, you cannot trust them that if they're going to use it in the right way. Maybe some clans will use artillery against another clan, <laughs> so you don't give them. <laughs> but um, when you see the fight against Al Shabaab, you cannot win with an AK against another AK. So you have an AK 47, Kalashnikov, which is like a small arm. Uh, Al Shabaab has um, the same thing, so maybe there is better to analyze the situation. 
to kind of lift the arms embargo step by step, and that's what the government and the international partners are trying to do. So when it comes to culture, <clears throat> Somalis are one people. They speak one language, they have one religion, they look the same. All of them are from one race, and the tradition is the same. We are not like the United States. A lot of people, different people, different culture. We don't we aren't like that. It, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's not, but that's how it is. The total area of Somalia is kind of 92% of taxes. So United States is a, is a continent, that's what I say. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a country. It's, it's very big continent from my perspective. We have clans that are nomadic who have a lot of livestock, like um, cows, goats, we drink a lot of, um, as you see in the, in the video, a lot of milk from the <coughs> camels. Somalia is always summer. You don't use a lot of jack big jackets, you don't need them. And mostly we don't think about the weather. No, nobody asks anyone, hey, what's the weather today? Nobody thinks about it. Everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows what to wear. Uh, you don't care about it. <laughs> the proximity to the equator, you have the second tree from here. The equator goes from there. It's a little bit um, different from the other places. But it's always summer. That's how the environment is. So when it comes to the culture, the culture is one. We have one language, you speak Somali. Somali is not like an Arabic, it's not like an English, it's a different thing. It is not like an Amharic, which is spoken in some uh, areas. For example, if I give you an example of Somali, um, how are you today is Sedertai Manta. That's Somali. In Arabic, كَيْفَ حَالُكَ الْيَوْمُ كَيْفَ حَالُكَ It's different, it's not the same thing. But the religion is one, and I'm coming back to that one. I will now come back. So these things show you some uh, environment that in, in the middle of Somalia we have some farms that we grow our own food. It comes like this. We have beautiful beaches, but nobody comes there because they're dangerous. <laughs> yeah. People get fish like that, kid. Camels are very important in Somalia. Very important. Like how important it is, let me tell you. If someone kills someone in any way, let's say not accidentally, they did it on purpose you have to pay for first the family of the victim if they forgive you they have the right to forgive you if they do that it's okay then you have to pay 100 camels and that ties back to the religion which comes a um, long time ago but camels are very important to someone like you pay back with camels for the life and one camel is like seven hundred dollars, sometimes one thousand dollars. One camel. So the language and religion. I kind of talk about the, the language. The religion is Islam. Seventh century. So in the sixth century, you have Islam in Arabia, in Saudi Arabia. In Mecca, the Prophet sallallahu peace upon him sent some of his companions to Africa, to Ethiopia, because they were persecuted in that area. And some of them, we believe, they came down to Somalia to talk to the people and tell them the message which was, there's one God. So there was no fight in Somalia to be Muslims. That's how they became. And we have one of the oldest mosques in the world, it has two directions. One direction of prayer is to Mecca. The other one is to Jerusalem. So Muslims used to pray to Jerusalem before they were ordered to pray to Mecca. 
So the religion uh, dates back to all ages. And everybody in Somalia and outside of Somalia who is Somali is Muslim, as what we know. So if you are not a Somali, it's okay. It's not a problem. But let's say Somali guy or a lady comes or in Somalia says, hey, today I'm not Muslim. I'm going to tell you the truth. It's, dif it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult. You cannot say that. Why? And is it a good thing? Or we, we can debate that a long time, but that's how it is. Everybody in Somalia is expected to be Muslim. But we have some Somalis who are outside of Somalia who denounce the religion, who may be Christians or I don't, I haven't seen any Jews, but a lot of Christians, and some of them atheists. But in the country, the culture and the people, there is kind of a, everybody expects you to be a Muslim. That's how it is. <clears throat> the economy, if you see this video, Somalis, they had a fight against each other, and then they went to United States and to UK mostly. UK said, hey, pleased to meet you. <laughs> and then civil war came out. Everybody went to United States or to UK or to other countries, mostly these countries. In Minneapolis, you have a lot of Somalis. They came back, and mostly they sent money back. So the economy of Somalia, long ago and until now, depends on people sending back their money back to Somalia. We have a lot of camels, the farming, all of that is also part of the economy. The economy is not that big, but people manage to live. They don't die in hunger. If you are not living in a very far away from the cities, when there is no rain, you may have a lot of um, difficulties with water because there is no rain. So sometimes you may hear in the, in the news, there's a lot, of pe a lot of people internal displaced into the cities, and some of you may send uh, help to them. So the population is like 15 million plus 2 million outside of Somalia. 70% of them are young, like in the prime working age. Over 2 million live in the capital city, which is Mogadishu. Somali women have a lot of kids. That's how it is. And why they have a lot of kids, we don't know, but they have a lot of kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, they love their kids. Because maybe my opinion would be they don't work much, they stay home. Uh, we have a culture that um, men work. Uh, women mostly, they stay together and they have a lot of talk with a lot of kids. Yeah, so mostly that's why I think they, they have a lot of kids and they love their kids. And, and the marriage religion gives the man the ability to marry another woman because the religion tries to stop illegal you know, activities. Some people think and say the opinions are when there's a lot of war, a lot of men die, and you have to get a lot of children, then you give the man the ability to, to marry. Some others say, if every man is working and he has only one wife, what happens to other women who's going to take care of them? They may end up in a bad environment in the community. So kind of a lot of um, ideas, but that's how it is. And mostly Somalis, they have two wives. That's the average. <laughs> <laughs> so the clans, very important thing in here, we have four big clans. The names are Hawiye, Darut, Isab, Rahanmin, and there's other clans. And we have also minority groups, which are Somalis, but mostly came from other, other places in Africa. So we have a system that's called 4.5, which means four clients, 0.5. So let's say you have 26 ministers to choose as a prime minister. You have to divide 4.5. You cannot give one or two clients 
all the ministers. The reason um, the opinions say is the, the regime in Nandi Nandi one abused the power and they gave the power to one or two clans and those clans they abused the power and they made all of suppressive issues and measures against other clans. So now nobody wants to be controlled by other clan totally. Everybody wants to have their phone, everybody wants to be able to call a minister or a senator or someone. So if you have a president from clan A, the prime minister will be clan B. The, the other system is the speaker of the parliament, which is kind of a number three, is from, should be another clan, not the president, not the prime minister, another clan. And then there's the, the, the judge of the, the court, right, the big court. That person will be another clan. So four people, different clans, kind of balancing the power. But uh, is it working? I don't know, but that's how it is. What is the conclusions here? So after this, we may have uh, a time for the questions. So think about your questions and what would you ask? So we have a long history, which is the place we are living has a long history. Culturally homogeneous people, we are the same people, same language, same color. We are very religious, that's how it is. Camels are our insurance policy. We don't have insurance companies. We don't pay insurance. If you hit someone, talk to them. Fix the problem. If you cannot fix the traffic issues with someone that you hit from the back, go to their elder if they, if they run away. Talk to their elder and the elder will pay you. If they don't pay you, that's not a good elder. Go to another one. There's a lot of elders that you can go. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how it is. No companies. Find the person and just know their name. You will find them. Young population. We are still trying to figure out how to live peacefully. And because we have a lot of, you know, elders, political leaders, who have different ideas and different interests. And we have religious leaders, so we have a lot of different aspects of community trying to figure out who has the power of what. One proverb is, be a mountain or lean on one. It's just a good proverb that I, try, I kind of thought to share with you. So if you have any questions, please ask me. I'm sorry if you felt very sleepy. <laughs> okay. Um, China is uh, uh, expanding influence in Africa. What is your relationship with China? Okay. Uh, China in Somalia, you will see they have an embassy there. They have good relationship with the government, but there's and there's also economic uh, relationship that they have. You may see a lot of business people in Somalia going to China to import their goods. That's the economic side of it. So if I uh, kind of explain the issue from diplomatic, military, economic, and information perspective, there is no information aspect of China in Somalia. They are not trying other than TikTok. There is no thing that trying to manipulate the Somalis. We don't have a lot of... So I am trying to be uh, frank here. Somalis think like, because they don't communicate that well with us, we kind of like, we don't talk to them much. So it's difficult for them to... I don't know why we do that, but... Um, it's difficult for them to communicate with Somalis and have a good relationship. That's what I think. From the military perspective, we don't have a good relationship in the military perspective. There's not a lot of trainings going on in China. From the political perspective, they, they don't have a political power influence that I know of. But maybe that's a good, idea, good thing for them, because some Muslim countries, for example, the United States, they know who is trying to become the president, and they try to choose one, which one we help. So maybe uh, some other people don't like that because if you if you read the comments on Twitter, for example, uh, or under the United States Embassy, United States Embassy, 
some some others are angry, like, hey, well, you know, said, why are you telling us what to do? Don't involve in our politics. But when you see the Chinese, they only talk about the economy. So that's maybe that's a strategy they are trying to use, but that's how it is, the Chinese aspect of it. Is it, is it good, answer? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you. Uh, your slide indicated elections, but then you said that your leadership was chosen by the elders. So what do you mean by elections? Because yeah. if your young people aren't elders, are they getting to vote for your leadership? What, how does yeah. that work? So now we are trying to be like one person, one vote election. We are trying to register everybody, but that will take a long time. We know this election is an indirect election, it's a corrupt election. People pay money to be elected. Everybody knows that. Like, if you want to be an, uh, a representative, you pay money to the others, and some others may take it or may not. So it's, it's a bad election, and everybody knows it. But that's the only thing that we have now in order to continue forward to to choose a president or something. But we know it's bad. That's the, the good thing that we have. We are aware of the risk. <laughs> yes. So this multiple wives thing, do they all live in the same like house? Or do you have like, here's a house for a wife or here's a house? How does that work? Thank you. Good question. So let's say a uh, man have two wives, let's say. Not three, let's say two. <laughs> so let's say he has two wives, the worst scenario would be he lives in the same area. So it's very difficult to see two wives living in the same house. It's very difficult. You you, you will not find it now. Because it's difficult. <laughs> and what they do is this. They have a house here and ten minutes away. We normally walk. We don't have a lot of vehicles, so he would have a house which is like ten minutes walk. Yeah. So one night he's here when it's like uh, five, like or four p.m. It's like hey, I'm going and he's at the house, and then he comes the next day. And when they have kids, the problem goes away. I don't know how. <laughs> Problem so, when, when I think of homogeneous societies, like you've painted them as homogeneous culturally, religiously, I, I think of them having a strong nation state where they can all come together and, and, and easier, right? Versus, say, Nigeria with the Yoruba and Igbo and Hausa, you know, the, the, the clans are very different culturally, right? Yes. So, so I'm curious to know what the lines of division are. It's obviously at the clan the level, but is it economic? Is it external influence? What what divides the people of Somalia? Okay, within the culture, what divides the the clans? What was the problem? That's what we're asking. Right. Yeah. Okay. So clan A and B. The problems they may have is first geography. They live in different locations, and everybody has different kind of uh, resources. So nobody wants to, there's just resources to be taken. That's number one. Number two is the political aspect of it. If you have a president from Clan A, they don't want Clan B to be the president. So why? Why they are having these problems? The why thing goes back to the history of this, because the thing is, when you live in a nomadic area, in a village, Outside of the village, you have a lot of um, a lot of camels and a lot of livestock. And when the rain goes, not in your area but other area, you have to go to that area because there is no rain here. When you go to that area, guess who you find in there? Another color lives there. And you may try to marry their ladies to kind of uh, form some uh, relationship with them, but they may end up to be not good or take your stuff. So then you try to invade them, take your stuff back. And the rain goes everywhere. So this thing goes back to the history because people, they know they are from the same people, but 
the places they live have different abilities and different resources and everybody wants to take that resource so there and there's no consensus on how to share them now so the problem is that one that's the history part of it now why we are fighting within the class now there is no real fight there is no real fight between clans now the problem is who will you appoint as a president from my clan or from the other clan because if you if if you don't have a minister like let's say the, the education minister my clan will not have the ability to go to universities because that minister likes his clan or her clan and they send their clan and people choose because of the clan not the capacity of the person so they are prone to corruption. So we have problems with that. So when you see a minister who is firing everybody who is not from their clan, you will be like, okay, next time I'm gonna have a, a minister here who is from my clan and I will fire everybody. That's what they do. But if, the, if, we, if we change the system, if we come up with a system that promotes the competency and the integrity, maybe we will solve this problem. Okay, uh, I need to stand up for this. Okay. Thank you for, uh, number one, I look like a Somali. <laughs> I am not a Somali. I look like an Ethiopian. I am not an Ethiopian. And I just found out that I'm an elder because I'm older than you. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm 56. Yes. So inshallah, yes. I will come to Somalia and be an elder. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you need your inner circle. <laughs> I'm going to choose you. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, I'll help you, Governor. <laughs> I mean, I'm... Okay. A uh, couple topics. Uh, what's the average life expectancy and what's the typical, I guess, cause of death if there is, um, yeah. if that's a study? And then secondly, what what is the um, typical food? Okay. National food or something yeah. that's common? The, the food, uh, let me start with the food. The food is very simple, very simple. In the morning we eat uh, kind of bread thing, that handmade bread, which is flat, with tea or a little bit of olive oil. That's the, the kind of uh, to go to. It's very simple, very easy. If you have a lot of, if you have like a little bit of money, you can buy um, a liver of a small goat. Which is very delicious. Yeah, or <laughs> some people like it. Morning. So lunch for United States, the dinner is the main thing. I think. Like if you are inviting someone, you are inviting them as a dinner. In Somalia, it's the lunch. Lunch would be with banana. Why there's no banana? I, I, I had to. Yeah. Banana is very important in Somalia. You should have a banana. <laughs> because we have a lot of bananas, maybe that's why. And banana with meat, which is kind of a, like a roasted beef or anything. We eat mostly goods with pasta or rice. And, and then mothers, what they would do, would do is they get a lot of vegetables. They kind of add up together, cook them, add some rice. And next to that, you will have uh, beef with good rice, with vegetables. And we drink a lot of uh, fruits. We don't drink water, normal water in the lunch. So the food is kind of uh, milk. The dinner would be very simple. We don't need a lot of uh, big dinner. Food, the food would be meat and milk in Somalia. That's the, the go to go to thing. If you are in the city, it's the bananas, vegetables, with rice and pasta. Rice and pasta are the, the two main things we eat. I don't know why, but that's how we do it. So life expectancy and the causes of death. Life expectancy, I would guess, I, I have never read a study done, but my thing is for the women it's different, for the men it's different. So for example, my father, my grandfather from my mother's side, and may God have mercy on him, he died at the age of 90. He was very old, but also very strong. 
my grandmother from mother's side, she's still alive, she's like 70, kind of thing. So, if you live in a small city and you work very every day, you, 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 like my grandfather used to wake up early, go, go to work. His work was a lot of camels, take care of the camels, come back, a lot of walking. So he, he lived long. But if you are in the cities, the causes of death would be suicide bombs, would be Al Shabaab targeting, would be um, small, like, kind of um, fights between clans sometimes. Diseases, I don't know, there's a lot of diseases now, but back then there was a lot of malaria and deaths, a lot of uh, diarrhea kind of things, but now people have the medicine to cure that stuff. So for the ladies, it's, I think ladies live more than men in Somalia. Yes, I think so. But men, they die early because of the wars and the conflicts that are going on. But like my grandfather, if you live in a normal environment, you may live up, up to 90. Yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of a crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a good place to live if you are out of the big cities. Okay. Uh, way back when the training was going on, did you have special, um, what were your um, spices? And do you use a lot of spice in your cooking? Okay. So in the cooking... And do you have spices that are just for you, from your country or from that area? Okay, yes. So, for example, when you're cooking food for the spices, we have the pepper. Mostly, that's what we have. We don't have uh, the spices that are like processed. We don't have processed spices, but mostly we have the pepper from the from our trees. And the the usage would be medium. If you go to Ethiopia, it's a lot. Ethiopian food is very spicy, but Somali food would not be that spicy. It's medium. So I don't know a, a spice that is only in Somalia, but yeah, that's not it. Any other questions, comments? What about the education of the children? Can you okay, the children, good that? question. So if you're a child in Somalia, five years old, when you're very young, or four years old, your parents take you to a madrasa. Madrasa is where you will learn the holy book of Islam, which is the Quran. Seven years old, after two years, they would add that to school, normal school. So, for example, my life. At 5.36 in the morning, I wake up, my mother wakes me up, and I go to Madrasa, which is like 10 minutes away from my home. Walk there, read two, three, five verses of the book. To the teacher. If the teacher finds well, he sends me back home. Have your lunch. At 7.30, you have to be at the school, and the school is the normal thing that you know in also in everywhere, like uh, from class 1 to 12. They teach you normal uh, mathematics, everything. The thing is, if you go to the madrasa and you cannot do your homework, you stay in the madrasa. So the madrasa is important than the school in my age, uh, now I don't know if they, if they change it. So th when you finish your Quran and you memorize it, some people will forget it, some people will still memorize it. You find, you, you finish your uh, 12th grade school, high school, and then in, when you finish high school, you, you have two options. You, you may know English well or the Arabic. That's the two options that you have. Because some high schools teach in English, which is like me, I uh, studied in English. Biology, chemistry, physics, everything was in English. My friend studied in Arabic. So you go to university, which teaches you English. And universities, we go mostly outside if you have the capacity to go. And in this, in this, in the, in Somalia, we have a lot of universities, but uh, 
if they teach good stuff or not. Uh, I don't know, but people go to universities also. It is also now go to universities compared to all the ages, like 20, 50 years ago. And the, this kind of uh, connected to your question, the wives. If a lady goes to university, she says, nope, only me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, you, you will say, is it the education that's giving them to know this option? I think not. Yeah, I think they have an option to work, to deny this. And they know a lot of, they have a lot of connections to work on. But if you are only from the high school and you marry, your, uh, your husband would be like, hey, I pay everything. And after five years, he'll be like, I'm going to marry another one. And you will have a fight, which takes a little bit of time, and you try to solve it. And then they may continue that one. But if she goes to university, she would say, and I kind of, uh, if you give them the word, it's okay. If you don't give them the word, you may lose them. And mostly, if you see the, in my age, they are married to only one. Yes. Is it from the ladies who are pressuring the men, or the men get a little bit educated? I don't know. <laughs> but that's how it's, it's connected to your. I was trying to. Yeah, I ask you that one. So, yeah. do you marry at a younger age? Is that one of the reasons yes. that you can get away by having two wives? And the follow up question is your, your, your part of education growing up. Was it in Somalia or was it outside Somalia? My education? Yes. Yes, okay, let me start with education. In, until my high school, I was in Somalia. After that, as my sponsor said, I went to Turkey for university. And then now for the master's degree, I came here. So, um, high school in Somalia, everything behind that is in Somalia. When it comes to the age of marriage, for men, I have a Example of one of my friends, he married in 17 years old. His father was like, you have to marry. He <laughs> said, it's good, marry him. He ended up marrying, and now he has six children. And he's, uh, he's like my age. So he was trying to also marry another one, and then he had a lot of problems. So <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to the ladies, they mostly marry younger age. I was talking with my uh, brother, and he said, uh, there was a lady that I'm trying to marry, and she's like uh, 22 years old, kind of old. And I was like, <laughs> 23 is old. I didn't tell him that I have a different opinion, but in Somalia, if a lady is like 23, 24, and she's not married, so what's going on with you? <laughs> so, they go, they go outside, they go to universities, to kind of the pressure of the, uh, the family and the community. So they marry at like 17, 18, 19, younger age, yes. So are your schools paid for by the government or by the parents? Yes, okay. And there's no government, there was no government that time. So if you go to Madrasa, you have to pay like $5 the teacher every month. The school is like, I remember it was $10 when I, when I graduated. So your father pays it. You call him, he may not like it, but hey, fine. $15, $15. And if his salary is like $300, he works. My father had a truck and to drive, and he used to deliver water, a big truck for water. So I don't know how much he earned, but it's, it was not very easy for him to have that conversation with me or with my mother. So, and you have to pay it. I'm going to school, you know. So it's like fifteen dollars, and your father, if your mother's working, it's very difficult. When I was in my age, to find a mother who's working to find, but your father pays it. And if the school knows that you may have problems with paying. And you have a lot of children. Like my father had uh, in school, at one time, 
six, five children in one school. So he, he, go, he goes to the principal and he said, hey, a lot of children, I can't pay them. You have to, I will be three of them. No, five out of three. Three out of five, and maybe six out of four, you know, kind of something like that, yes. But there is no government that pays for uh, school. Now we have some schools that are paid by the government. So what, what's the biggest misconception or stereotype that's false that people from the United States have about either Somalia or the Somali people? Good question. Uh, a bias, misconception, or an idea which is which happens to be wrong that the United States people may have yeah. about Somalia. We are very underdeveloped. We may not have a lot of materials like the US people may have. A lot of vehicles, a lot of Houses, you know, we may not have that thing, but we are happy, and let me tell you how we are. For example, uh, my mother, let's say, for example. She lives in a house, she has my sister, she goes to school, and my uh, uncle's child also lives with my mother. They go to school, both of them together, two ladies. My mother stays home, and like, like the other day I was talking with my mom, and she says, it's like 8.30 in the morning and there's nothing to do. And you know what she does? She goes to her mom, which is like five minutes away from her. And her mom, like my grandmother, she, her house is like a hub. Everybody comes there. Mm -hmm. And they have a conversation, they have a tea. Sometimes they go out to make a barbecue outside of the city with a goat, a small goat. And then they go to the places that they lived uh, when they were young, in the villages. So, if you have problems, your, your family takes care of it. If you don't have problems, go to your mom, grandmother's mom, home and have some tea with her. <laughs> yes. So, we are happy and I don't think, uh, maybe that's a misconception. Do you think that's a good answer? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. If you want, I can add another one, but another misconception would be the religion. Yes, for example, everybody's Muslim in Somalia. So you would ask, why everybody's Muslim? Are they not critical thinking? Are they not using their mind to explore their ideas of believing? Some of them may think there is no God. Some of them may think uh, Jesus is the God. Some of them may think it is only the Jews who are right. People may have different ideas. So you may ask the question, my bias would be, you guys are not thinking, you are, and when you go to, when you are small, when you are a kid, you are sent to the madrasa, and you are programmed in the madrasa, and you live your life what your madrasa told you and what your teacher told you, and you may be a potential terrorist. That's, that's a big misconception that you may have. So let me give you an example from my life. I went to madrasa, I learned the Quran, the meanings, everything. Do you have time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We have uh, time. Okay. So uh, I went to madrasa, I learned everything, because my, mother, my parents wanted me to learn those stuff. Let me tell you my uh, struggle with religion that I had. And a lot of people in Somalia had that. The struggle was like this. My father, he has his idea, everything set up. So he wants me to go to the masjid, which is the mosque. Early in the morning, pray there, read Quran, be very religious person. That's how he is. But I, 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 I mean, like I want to play out, to go outside, play football, soccer, which is not <laughs> yes, and have some, do some trouble things, you know, uh, throw stones to people, you know, <laughs> kind of a kid stuff, you know, that's what I want to do. And um, my father, no, and my father's like, 3 p.m., it is the prayer, it is the time of the prayer, you have to come to the mosque, I have to see you. And, 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 yeah. So let's say 3 p.m. is my game time. I have to play games. I don't want to go to mosque. So I had a lot of problems with my father because I was not willing to do what he wants me to do. 
I grew older, I went to Turkey in 2017, which was kind of my turning point. I did, I did a lot of bad stuff. And then I was like, what is going on with my life? And where I'm going, am I dying? Yes, I am dying, but what's going to happen after death? So I was like, okay, I have a baseline to start with, the Quran, the my religion. So I kind of revisited my ideas of the Quran. And then I read, I watched a lot of videos about Christianity. Oh, sorry, I didn't want to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my God. American stuff. <laughs> so, uh, I revisited my ideas, I watched a lot of Christian movies and uh, missionaries, and they speak, the Jews. So the thing is this, if you read the Quran, you already know the Christianity, you already know Jews. The Quran tells you, you have to believe in their book, you have to believe in the Torah, you have to believe in the Bible. So I don't believe that. Quran just adds one more prophet, Muhammad. He says, Jesus is a prophet, Moses, good to go. Those two are prophets, no problem. They're not God's prophets, that's what the Quran says. So I'm kind of like, okay, Jesus maybe is a prophet. It's, it's, it's a divine thing to be you know, praised. So I visited my ideas and then I ended up believing in myself that there's only one God and I pray directly to him. When it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, there's a lot of books, a lot of religious aspects that you can learn from him. And when you see what he's teaching you, myself, I ended up believing that this is a good person who this is a good person who's trying to tell me, hey, you're gonna die, and when you die, there's a judgment today, and you have a creator, and he will judge you, and he will ask you. What have you done with your money, with your life? Have you respected your father or mother? Have you did bad things to innocent people? Very clear, I said, this is good, I like it. So, and, he's, and, and then he said, you have to pay every day five times. To who, to you? No, he said, no, not to me. To, the, to your creator, and I said, that was, that was hard for me for that time. And then, for the last years, I ended up praying every day. I was not like this. So that's my personal journey to Islam. In, in Somalia, you may say people may not have the ability to go to the United States, to go to Turkey, to watch a lot of YouTube videos, they may not have internet. They may end up not questioning their ideas. That's another story. But I am uh, really, um, I'm, I'm really very happy is what I believe, and I'm happy for them. But I also believe that everybody ends up questioning their life in one time, and then they decide. Maybe they will not say they are not Christians or Muslims or Jews, but they will end up believing something and living with that. So I think they also have some questioning aspect of it. Thank you. And we're not going to tell you Okay, I think we'll go ahead and end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, my name's Nancy Whitmire, and I'm the uh, program chair for Greater Kansas City People to People. And typically, um, our president, um, Zahid Awan does this, but he's not here. He's been traveling since before Christmas, I think, so he'll be home soon. But um, he will uh, send a certificate of appreciation to Rahman uh, and thanks for uh, taking your time and effort to appear today in addition to your busy schedule and studies. We're most grateful. Your excellent presentation will have long-range effects on those attending. They will remember these moments uh, of a unique opportunity to learn about Somalia from one of its finest military officers. So we really, really appreciate your uh, and discussion and your frankness uh, in answering questions. And um, it's just so interesting uh, to hear about all the different countries. 
um, we, uh, we, so we will get you that certificate um, when Zaki comes back. I just wanted to mention we do have two more circles of knowledge and we will get uh, mailed chimps about these. Um,